Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Cisco SDA or SD Access Tech Talk webinar. My name is Alif Musa, and I'm outsourced by Sunset Learning Institute to Cisco Systems. I work for Cisco uh, Solution Readiness Engineers, or SRE, and our team's mission is to enable Cisco partners and customers to use new products and technologies. And to do that, we host and develop uh, lab contents and conduct boot camps, tech talks, and hands-on lab sessions. Uh, today, we're going to introduce you to Cisco SD Access or Software Defined Access. I'd like to remind you that uh, the session will be recorded and it will be available on Sunset website soon. Uh, for the people who joined us yesterday uh, in our tech talk about DNA Center, uh, we talked about Cisco DNA as a controller, and we had some use cases, uh, how to use DNA Center to manage our network. Today, we're going a little bit deeper, and we'll talk about Cisco SD Access, or what we call it, SD Fabric. So SDA is an intent-based network solution, and DNAC is the essential part of the SDA Fabric. Uh, additional to DNAC, we will need uh, ICE for policy to enforce security. So we cannot say that we can have SDA access without both DNA and ICE. Uh, both need to be integrated and intercommunicated. So we need to differentiate here between DNA and SDA because there are a lot of confusion. You can have DNA as a controller in your network, use it to help you do uh, like regular uh, uh, tasks, uh, sort of automation, onboarding, provisioning, or plug and play. Uh, you can also use it to upgrade your uh, uh, software management, like SWIM. You can use it for management of wireless. There are a lot of use cases of DNA without having a fabric. So again, DNA is the fabric controller, and it will deliver the business intent through policies and the configuration. It will also collect information about uh, the fabric health. So software defined access has three basic principles. First, one automated fabric for wireless and wired network. We should have the exact same policy for both wireless and wired users. We don't have now the confusion we had in the past or the complexity we had in the past of additional layer of management of wireless user. Now you can consider your wireless users uh, connected to your access switches or edge node switches in the fabric, similar to any wired user. Two, uh, identify base policy and segmentation, or simply we can say security. And this is mainly the rule of ICE. Three, assurance by analyzing the network telemetry and ensure fabric health. So let's take a look high level to the SD access. What is SD access? And let's see why there's confusion between DNAC and SD access. Software defined access is a campus fabric. And when we say fabric, we mean network overlay built on infrastructure underlay. With all known approaches of configuration, and automation, policy, telemetry, combined all with DNA Center as a fabric controller. So today we're talking about fabric and we had many other fabrics we use in the past. So connecting all network devices in full mesh is a dream for every network engineer, and that's not feasible, it's very expensive. But the term fabric give us the impression that everything is connected in full mesh. So the overlaying network, which is the logical connections built over the actual network, which is the underlay, it knows how to reach to every other device in the network, regardless of how the physical underlay looks like. So SD access is not the only known overlay. We worked with other overlays like GRE, MPLS, DMVPN, MPLS, CAPWAP, all these examples on top of ACI for data center. Uh, to be able to implement the overlay, we need to add additional header with extra information to allow the reachability. And you can use this header to add additional information. Uh, we worked with VLAN ID, MPLS tag, uh, which represents certain bits in the header. Now, 
Today, we will have extra header for VXLAN, extra headers for LISP. These are the protocols which can be used in SD access. It's very important for us to understand SD access to separate the underlay from the overlay networks. Uh, there's still physical cable and control plane doing the work in the underlay. And that will allow the connectivity between all underlay elements. So the, the underlay edge devices will add the extra header required for the overlay fabric to work. So we can say that edge devices live in both networks. It understands the underlay, participate in it, and it sees the overlay. Uh, on the other hand, the overlay has, it is separate management protocol. It has nothing to do with the underlay, totally isolated. And the control plane, totally separate from the underlay control plane as well. And it uses extra header, as we said, to do that work. And that work cannot be done without the extra header of uh, added by the underlay, which we call encapsulation. If you're familiar with ACI, this is another example of, fab of fabric. Uh, there are a lot of similarities with SD access, but uh, ACI is very controlled environment. So it mandates what underlay it is required. It doesn't allow you to use underlay. The ACI need to, in, to, to construct its own fabric. It use its own tool. It mandate the use of uh, ISIS. Uh, it will do the auto discovery. You cannot have sort of like brownfield. It's always greenfield. And that's because of the complexity of data center. There is no tolerance in like doing mistakes in data center. The difference here, SD access is campus technology. So uh, you may have old network and SDA access need to be able to use it as underlay. And that's what is called manual underlay. So as long as the manual underlay allows IP reachability between all endpoints, you don't have to change your existing network. You can use it as your underlay and start building your overlay. Uh, there is also possibility to automate the underlay build. So you can start by one device called a seed and it will discover all other network equipments connected to it and it will program IP addressing and routing and all other uh, relevant uh, configuration required. And in this case, the automation uses ISIS as routing protocol. And now uh, it is more open to use other routing protocol like uh, OSPF. Uh, if you uh, have a question why we need to use ISIS, ISIS is brought back and uh, started to be used by many fabrics and many technologies because it is uh, protocol independent. It, it's able to carry uh, uh, different protocols and it can start the work independent of IP addressing and that make it uh, ideal for uh, automated tasks. So you don't have to go and enter uh, IP configuration to establish connectivity between devices. They can uh, discover each other, they can establish communication and that will help the controller to collect information about these devices. So when we build SD access, we need to have different rules here. Uh, every device will have uh, its own uh, rule and its, its own policies. Let's start by the DNA center. DNA center here, it is helping us to do automation and assurance. This is the core of the SDA fabric. It is the controller then we said that we cannot build a fabric without having ICE, Identity Service Engine. Identity Service Engine here, it is, it's used to enforce policy. It is the security part of the fabric. Uh, and when we say identity, the identity can be as simple as MAC address, or it could be like as complex as user A who's logged on device B on day X and uh, time Y, which is different than the same user A who's logged on to device C on the same time X and, uh, sorry, day X and time Y. We have also the control plane. This is a very essential member of any fabric. When you establish a fabric, you need to assign uh, one device to be a control plane node. Uh, the, the control plane will map systems that are uh, meant to be managed by 
uh, the, the fabric. So it does mapping between or relationship between uh, the host mobility and locations for both wired and wireless network. So any device need to know where this host is, it's gonna send the request to control plane. And for control plane not to understand that or to learn that, all other devices in the fabric need to register any host connect to it with the control plane. If you are familiar with LISP, uh, this is uh, part of LISP work in the overlay and maybe uh, other tech talks can go deeper in LISP if you're interested in. Uh, we can provide uh, more information with Sunset Team. We have also the fabric border nodes. Fabric border nodes allow SDA fabric to communicate with non-fabric traditional network. So when you create your fabric, you don't have to move everything immediately. You create your fabric, start by breaking devices, but these devices will be able to communicate with non-fabric devices through the border nodes. We have also a fabric edge node. The fabric edge node here is connected to directly to uh, the host or the endpoint, and that includes uh, the fabric wireless access point. So consider this as your access switches. Every device will connect to the fabric edge node. Fabric edge node will go to the control plane and do registration. I have that address or that identity connected to me. Now, any other device want to reach to this host, it need to ask control plane where it is available. There's also a mechanism to update this register when the host moving between edge switches. So you don't need to change IP addressing when devices uh, are moving or mobilizing in your network. We have also the fabric wireless controller or we connected or, or we call it uh, like uh, uh, enabled fabric enabled wireless controller. Uh, it connect the fabric access points and wireless endpoints to the SD access fabric. Uh, the controller will, will inform the control plane nodes about the endpoints locations and information. So any host connecting to access point and wireless controller will be registered by wireless controller to the control plane. But the connection here between host will not go through the controller. The connection will go through the switches. We know that uh, access points will be connected to the access switches or what we say here, fabric edge nodes. So we will have now two types of CAPWAP tunnels. The control CAPWAP, which is going between the access point and the wireless controller, which has all information about signaling, RF, all other noise to a signal ratio, all of these uh, telemetry and information. The end user data is gonna be terminated at the edge switch. So we have data cap map, which will be terminated between the access point and the edge switch. So the traffic here from the user will never go to the wireless controller again. And this is where we say that a single policy will be applied to both wired and wireless users because both of them, the communication of both of these hosts will be terminated at the access point, at the access switch or the fabric edge nodes. And at this time we can apply the same policy and we can say, that they are treated equally. They are not different anymore. We have also the intermediate nodes here. These intermediate nodes shouldn't be part of the fabric. These just allow interconnectivity between devices. You don't have to give them any rule. For example, these are core switches or distribution switches, which allow IS, ISIS or OSPF and allow connectivity between these devices. You don't have to join it to the fabric. You don't have to allow uh, any role on it. It's just sitting in the background and it's part of the underlay. But without them, fabric won't work. And if you ask me a question why, because underlay won't work behind them and there is no connectivity between these devices. So if they can't see each other, then the fabric is broken. So, Let's look at rules and platforms. Which platforms can be used on these different rules? We start by control plane node. Uh, the control plane node will have a host tracking database that maps endpoint IDs and the current location. And these IDs can be layer two or layer three, IPv4 or IPv6 addressing. So these control plane 
node will receive the registration from the edge node. And it will, it will resolve the lookups for the endpoints locations. What platforms can be used for this? Uh, definitely Catalyst 9K is built to run SDA. In uh, Cat 9K, most of the platforms can act as a control node. And I say most because the Catalyst 9200s cannot be included here. And the reason why is limitation on database size. There is a limitation on uh, 9200 capability of running database and running the lookups. So 9300, 400, 9500, 9600 can work perfectly as control node. I don't have to buy new equipment. If I have Catalyst 3K, 6K, uh, if I have ASR or ISR in my network, I can use even ENCS. I can use any of these platforms as a control node. You can see like uh, 9K cannot be used for the same limitation why 9200 cannot be used. Other type of nodes here, the edge nodes. The edge nodes connect endpoints to the fabric and it's responsible for the onboarding and the security authentication. It also provides any cast L3 gateway for the connected devices. So every edge switch has the same IP address in the fabric. This is not something related to SDA, it is inherited from the fabric. So that meaning you will have any cast three, uh, layer three gateway in your fabric. The cool thing when host move from or to another location, it doesn't know that it's talking to different machine because it's still dealing with the same IP address. That reminds us of HSRP and VRRP uh, uh, layer three gateways. CAT9K, all of them, including 9200, are capable of uh, being edge node. They act as access switches here. But you need to consider a limitation on 9200. On 9200, if you buy the 9200, there's limitation on the number of VRFs. So it can act as edge nodes, but with, minim with uh, I think, two or three uh, number, uh, maximum number of VRFs. Traditional access switches, Catalyst 4500, 6K, and 3K can act as access, as the access edge nodes. Now, when we talk about border nodes, we have three main types of border nodes. Let's say it's two and one hybrid. The internal border nodes, it connect the fabric to known areas of the company legacy network. Let me say, you have a data center, headquarter, and branch. Uh, the internal board, and you have, let me say, you have the fabric in your data center. So the internal border will connect your fabric to the branch and the headquarter, and it's going to import the IP addresses of these networks because it's known to, to, to uh, your network, it's known to your routing table, and it's going to register it with the control node. At the same time, it's going to export the fabric IP addresses to these devices because there is routing exchange between them. Now, we have also the external border. External border connect the fabric to unknown areas of the company network. So let me say if you have a merger and the other network has uh, uh, like summarized IP address of 10.3.0.0 slash 16, any subnet within that network considered unknown to your network. It's just summarized IP address and go to that gateway. So the external border will not import these summits. It will have only that summarized route. Other use for external border, we can say the gateway for internet. Internet IP addresses shouldn't be imported. So external border will allow connectivity of the fabric to the internet. And the hybrid is a single border will act as both internal and external. So to connect the fabric to the rest of your network and to the internet. How you uh, configure external, internal, and internal and external uh, borders. Uh, there are a small check mark on checkbox on uh, DNA when you configure your fabric. It's either allowing default to all virtual networks, that means you are making it internal and external, or you click do not import external routes that make it only external. 
So what platforms can work as border nodes? Catalyst 9K, all of them except 9200 for the same limitation. And traditional networking is like Cat3K, 6K, ISR, and ASR. And you can see here that Nexus 7K also can act as border node. And this is one of the few Nexus devices which can be used um, or have the rule of uh, fabric. So I want to go a little bit deeper on the internal border and external border. What, what make them different? Internal border, it connect to known subnets, as we said, of your network. So it export internal, internal IP pools of the fabric to outside and aggregate all the IP addresses and routing protocol IP addresses of the outside network, aggregate and bring it in uh, and register it with the control node. So now any device want to reach to any IP, it will uh, resolve, try to resolve that IP address with the control, control node. Control node will say, yeah, I know that IP address, it is behind this border node. You hand it over there and the border node will do its work. So it imports and registers non-fabric network known subnets into the control plane map systems. So it import and export. These are the two main keywords. External, it exports the internal IP pools outside, but it doesn't import unknown routes to the control plane. So it acts like default exit if no entry is available. So the device goes to control plane and say, I want to know what IP address uh, 4.4.4.4, where it is, control the control plane doesn't know because it's not registered with it. So it will say, okay, go to the external border that will connect you outside. A fabric enabled wireless controller here, a little bit more in depth on the CAPWAP, the two types of CAPWAP we have. Uh, the, the wireless controller here will be integrated into the fabric to allow SD access wireless clients and connect them to the fabric border. So there are two types of CAPWAP, as we said, control uh, CAPWAP, which will manage the access points. And we have the data CAPWAP, which will manage the data like carried from endpoints. Uh, the control CAPWAP here will be terminated at the wireless controller direct from the access point to the wireless controller as we see. So this is like typical wireless controller. We don't have to apply any policies in the fabric to the control kappa. This is something between access points and wireless controller. I don't have to interfere. Now, data plane is gonna terminate at the edge node here. So the access point will create data plane, data plane um, kappa to the edge node here and that make any connection to any wireless customer here treated similar to any other wired connection. So I don't have that difference. So any policy I apply here to clients, it will go on both wired and wireless. That reduce the overhead of carrying this data from the access points all the way to the wireless controller in traditional networking. This is great feature and uh, it's, uh, it, it's really resolved the problem of two management for uh, wired and wireless networks. Uh, the support of uh, wireless uh, SDA fabric, uh, both new and old access points and controllers support that SDA. We have the Catalyst 9800 uh, wireless controllers and we have the Catalyst 9100 access points. They're both supported. Also, we have the ROS uh, wireless controller and access points supported. Some platforms are not able to uh, add ex uh, encapsulation or add tags to traffic. An example, the industrial uh, platforms like IE 3300, 4000, and 500, 5000. We have also the Catalyst building, digital building for building management system. We have also the 3560 compact series. These are not capable of tagging and adding encapsulation. So these types of switches with this limitation cannot act as part of the SDA unless we use the extended node portfolio. So the SDA access extension allow the use of these 
uh, industrial and compact and digital building switches, and it will do the encapsulation. It will add the tag on their behalf. Quick look at the fabric construct here. We have uh, the term virtual network. Virtual network is equivalent to VRF in traditional networking. So it is the layer three uh, domain or routing domain. Uh, the virtual network or VRF is used for macro segmentation. And you're gonna see here, we have two terms, macro segmentation and micro segmentation. An example of uh, uh, mac difference between macro and micro segmentation, uh, all members of a single VLAN can communicate with each other. So we don't have micro segmentation in this case, but two VLANs cannot communicate with each other unless we have routing and the routing here uh, fulfill the macro segmentation rule. What if I want to um, control the access between the VLAN members? Then I have the uh, VLAN access list, which allow micro segmentation. Virtual network or VRF allow macro segmentation between uh, these devices in DNAC. Border nodes will add the VLAN ID or, uh, sorry, the VRF ID or virtual network ID tag to the fabric encapsulation. Now the border nodes should be able to map the virtual network to the traditional VRFs. So it allow non-fabric devices keep the routing related to this virtual network in their own VRF because non-fabric devices doesn't understand VN, but understand VRF. Mapping is done at the border node. We have also uh, what we call scalable group, SGTs. Scalable group tag allow micro segmentation. It can be achievable in SD access using uh, the uh, scalable group on ICE. And it can be like unique identifier of like different address independent groups used to manage uh, the group based policies. Uh, these SGTs are added to the encapsulation by the border nodes as well. Uh, the SGTs will be added to VNID as additional uh, bits to the header. And that will allow what we call micro segmentation. So now we have two terms, micro segmentation and micro. Micro segmentation is allowed by VN or VRF. Micro segmentation is allowed by SGTs. How we can apply policies using SGTs? We can build uh, what we call scalable group ACLs or SG ACLs. We have also another name uh, for VLAN here. We call it host pool or it can represent the interface SVI if you look at its configuration from traditional perspective. Uh, the edge node's responsibility is to map the endpoint IDs, uh, which are connected to, 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 to the SVI per VN uh, or VRF. So host pools can be assigned statically or can be like by port. Uh, I just configure this uh, port as part of that host pool or can be dynamically using host authentication like ICE, when it does authentication, it's assigned to a certain host pool or like VLAN in traditional networking. Uh, we talked about Anycast Gateway. The Anycast Gateway uh, provide a single layer three gateway for IP endpoints. It's similar to HSRP and VRP in traditional networking. They use shared virtual IP and virtual MAC address. Uh, that's why we said that the endpoint doesn't know if it's talking to different device when it mobilizes in your network. Wherever it goes, it will hold the same IP address and it will talk to the same gateway. So this will allow us to use switch subnets. So IP subnets can be switched over the overlay. So a VLAN is not longer needed to connect two hosts. You don't need to keep two hosts in the same proximity in the same VLAN to allow communication. That's traditional network, Tim. Uh, we still need to support applications which has only layer two broadcast and layer two connectivity. So we need to have a layer two overlay. SDA access provide that layer two overlay and support these applications using what we call multicast underlay groups. And we're gonna see why we selected uh, certain protocols to, to use in SDA based on uh, the requirement of allowing layer two. Um, the layer two overlay can be enabled for specific host pools that require LT uh, overlay, or you can disable it if you don't need it. 
So we talked here about uh, three planes in SD access, control plane, data plane, and policy plane. Let's go and look real quickly what protocols we used in each one. Control plane, basically using LISP, Locator Identifier Separation Protocol. If you want to understand control plane of SDA, you can go and look for LISP protocol. Um, it is uh, it, it's the same standard LISP with tweaks uh, to allow extra features in SDA. Data plane is based on VXLAN or virtual extensible LAN. Uh, if you're working with DC and ACI, you're familiar with it, but VXLAN here is different than the VXLAN of DC. Also, it is best uh, built based on the standard, but tweaked to allow extra features for SD access. The policy plane here is based on Cisco Trust or Cisco Trust SIC. We call it CTS. So these technologies are already exist. They are not new invention and they are standard based, but they are tweaked and combined in a specific way to form the SDA. So why LISP is chosen and preferred over other protocols like BGP, EVPN? Uh, routing protocols are advertisement based. So it involves updates and flood control and many other concepts while well, LISP is a mapping protocol. As we said, there is a database, you register that uh, host in that database with the location and that's it. Uh, very simple lookup will bring the results. Imagine the size of BGP routing table on every fabric node if we used uh, eBGP, uh, eVPN. So if we have like massive 32 host entries of all fabric nodes in the table, it will be gigantic, it will be so big. And that will limit the number of platforms which can be used as control plane, and that will increase the cost and will add time to the process. But in this case, with LISP, mapping database can manage this issue as fabric node need to track the endpoints connected to it, and will register it with the control node. So LISP is on-demand mapping protocol, and that's made it better for SD access. Do you need to understand LISP to understand SDA? No, everything is done automatically here. You don't have to. But if you go in details of LISP, you understand it. You can use LISP command uh, to go to any router and do troubleshooting and verification. So additional knowledge will give you uh, a lot of capabilities, will give you better understanding, will allow you to play like a master. But if you don't know it, that doesn't mean you cannot use SDA. Everything is built, DNA is doing it on your behalf. So you don't need to open the hood of your car and do all the fix required to drive it. You can drive it. If you're a mechanic, you know everything. Well, you can go off-road, you can go deserts uh, with no fear. Uh, LISP has its own terminology here. And we can map these uh, terms to the SD access terminology. So we can say um, EID or endpoint identifier is your IP address. We have the term RLOC or routing, router, routing locator. This is the router loopback address. Uh, LISP has a map server or resolver. This is equivalent to control plane mode. So if you have control plane and uh, overlay in SDA, you should keep in mind that if you talk LISP, that device is the map server or resolver. We have also the LISP tunnel router, XTR or ITR slash ATR. And ITR is for internal, ETR for external, XTR for internal and external together. And that remind you of the edge node, which we talked about, which register the ID with the map server node. And as we said, it's the same rules here. You can import all routing from known networks or uh, you don't import it and act as default gateway if you're external. So let's see how it behaves. We have the device here or a host 10.2.2.2 connected to 10.2.1.2.1. The edge node 2.1.2.1 will send a map register to the control node here. And now the control plane 
will uh, will have an X database that 10.2.2.2 is connected to 2.1.2.1. Let me say any device want to communicate with 10.2.2.2 and the device come here from branch. The router here or the fabric age is gonna send the resolve request, lookup request to the control plane. The control plane will find its database and it will return the locator to the border and now the border can communicate directly to the device. Now, if the device move to another fabric edge, this edge node is gonna go and register itself with this controller. It will say, I have now 10.2.2 connected to me. Now I have a new registry for the same host. In this case, the controller will have the new registry in its database and it's gonna send a message to this edge node telling it, 10.2.2.2 is not connected to you anymore. It should tell it because this device doesn't flush silent hosts. It shouldn't. It just uh, remove it when it hear from control plane that it's not connected to you again. So do we need to run this lookup process every time we need to run communication? No. The fabric age will have will create its own cache and it will keep this information handy and it will flush this with time like any caching mechanism. So this is how communication will run. And let's look at Lisp, the traditional standard and Lisp for SD access. As we said, there are many features now supported with Lisp for SD access like layer two extensions. It's limited on the traditional Lisp, but it's supported on SD access. The roaming and wireless extensions were not available on Lisp. They are now on SD access. And layer three VM was supported only, but now we have here the VN and VXLAN supported in Fabric. So it is, um, let me say, enhanced Lisp for SD access. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, SD access data plane. The data plane here using VXLAN. So you can see the original ethernet and IP headers in the original packet in this case here. Let me say, I wanna use Lisp for data plane. Can I use Lisp for data plane? Lisp will strip the ethernet header from this packet and will add its own Lisp and uh, its own uh, header. In this case, that make uh, the data plane good enough for layer three, but not good at all for layer two. That's why VXLAN is used in this case. VXLAN keep the ethernet and that allow ethernet uh, or layer two and layer three support for the network. Another reason for selecting VXLAN, you can see here the original uh, packet header in blue that include layer two and layer three headers. Layer 4 UDP header will have a specific port in the destination, which will help the system to identify uh, it, to identify the packet as a VXLAN packet. So at this point, the system can identify the VNID and SGTs and other VXLAN tags. Excuse me for one minute. A lot of dogs require some water. So quick comparison here between VXLAN standard and VXLAN used for SD access. The standard doesn't support SGTs. We have it here supported in SDA and wireless and layer two extension were not supported. Now it's supported in SD access. The policy is enforced using SGTs as we said. So the ability of VXLAN, VXLAN to carry the VRF and the SGTs allow the, the, the enforcement of address um, dependent policies by, by the edge nodes. I don't have to look to the address to allow or deny. I look to the SGT or VRF and apply the logic. Uh, the virtual networks do not naturally talk to each other. So they are isolated virtual routing and forwarding tables. And that's why they allow what we say macro segmentation. Now, the communication inside the VM is allowed by default. So to control the access within the VM or VRFs, we need to use the scalable group policies here, which we call it micro segmentation. Now I can do security, access control, quality of service, policy-based routing, span, and other things based on the tag. 
it is address independent. Even if it moves wherever it is, the address changed, I don't care. It has that tag and that tag is for me uh, what I use for policy. Uh, the tag can be assigned to the port statically. So I can say switch three port two one has uh, this SGT or it can be dynamically assigned through the integration with ICE. So user A uh, logged into device B at time uh, X, give him this SGT. If he go to device B, then give him another SGT. That give me a lot of uh, possibilities and control. We can also create uh, the access control policies using the source and destination SGTs instead of IPs. So it's layer for uh, like policy and we can call it now a contract. If you're familiar with ACI, you can say that yes, that's what's called in ACI. It's, it's a contract, it's a low communication between objects. So this is how it will work. The first switch, will identify who is this based on the authentication, and then it will assign the tag. Now the switch will encapsulate the traffic. Traffic will be carried over to the destination edge node and the, edge, the destination edge node will decapsulate it. Once the destination node identify the group tag, now it can enforce the policy because it is known for it. Traditional Cisco trust sec here, different than SD access, as we said, SD access enhanced all these protocol. So VN integration was not supported. Uh, QoS was not supported. Traffic copy policy or span was not supported. Now all supported. And also it is now end to end with SDA, but TrustSec was hub by hub. So a lot of improvements here. We're too close to the end of our session. So I need to go real quick here to see uh, what type of sites I can have. This is an example of single site topology for SD access. I created a fabric and added every device to that fabric. So you can see here, this is the line which defined my fabric. This is not the best design, but this is what we had before we get the multi-site infrastructure. So all sites and buildings interconnected by Metro Ethernet connection in this case, and they're a member of the same fabric. So if end-to-end -end segmentation is requirement, then I need to stretch the fabric between these sites. Because if I just make this site a single fabric, I cannot exchange segmentation between the two sites, unless I have special arrangement, which I will gonna see in a while. With a single site architecture, subnet will be made available across all sites and will have a big failure domain. This is another drawback. That's why we don't like it. Another challenge is a scale limitation in number of IP pools and border control plane nodes per site. This is a better design. So the same topology, but we have multi-site topology architecture here. Each site or building is operating in its independent fabric. So in this case, each fabric has its own age, border and control nodes. The challenge here is there is no end-to-end -end segmentation because we're gonna strip these additional headers because now we are traditional IP routing here. We don't have the additional VXLAN and LISP capabilities. Now, in this case also, we need a fusion router. A fusion router is a router which understand both VN and VRF and allow interrouting between these IP and fabric. This is the best, which I love to see. The same topology, but we have overlay expanding over WAN and that's the access transit help to achieve end-to-end -end segmentation architecture here because we're using the SD access transit. So we're extending or adding LISP and uh, VXLAN and uh, CST to my WAN. Can I use SD WAN, Cisco SD WAN, Victrola? Yes. We can see that also in the near future. So these are some of the benefits of SD access for the distributed campus. The scalability, the fusion device is not required for every site now, so you're saving uh, configuration and devices. Uh, you make the fault domains isolated and smaller, and you allow end-to-end -end segmentation. 
Uh, the difference between fabric domain and fabric site here is very simple. Fabric domain is multiple fabric sites interconnected to each other, and they're connected using a transit network. And we're going to see that we have two transit network. We have regular IP transit network, and we have SD transit in a while. Uh, if you have, uh, we have different uh, flavor of DNA. These are different, the three types of hardware, L and X large, regular L and X large. And these are the limitation of each of these uh, hardware when you use an SD access. Also, there is latency requirements. The round trip time between the fabric nodes, regardless of what type of transit connecting these devices, Metro Ethernet, SD1, DSL, whatever, there is a minimum requirement of latency between ICE and DNAC, 200 RTT should not be broken. Between Edge and DNAC, 100 millisecond RTT. Between, uh, let me say, border and ICE, 100 millisecond control and wireless controller to the DNAC should be 100 milliseconds. So there are, these are the requirements. If you break it, it's going to affect the performance and you get unexpected results. Transit types. If we want to connect to SDA sites, we have regular IP-based network. We have the SD access transit, which uh, extend the fabric to the WAN, and we have the Cisco SD WAN transit. In short, the SD access transit uses the native SD access encapsulation for multiple fabric site. And the key consideration here for the Swift campus is use SD access transit in like high bandwidth, low latency, and support of Jumbo packets on the WAN. So basically, you're just extending your SD access to the WAN. Less VXLAN CST are going there. They are not stripped off at the WAN edge. Now, if you don't have uh, the SD access, we need WAN intelligence in this case, like we need traffic steering, policy-based routing, we need optimization, encryption services, whatever. So this is where we need to use the IP-based transit, and that would be a good option to consider, but we need to consider here that when you use IP-based transit, we are stripping LISP, VXLAN, and CST headers. So there should be a way to transfer these information between sites. Best of both here, you have uh, one intelligence as a requirement and SLA based routing, and you have MPLS and internet connectivity with higher latency, then SD1 is your option. So you can use SD1 here as a transit between and segmentation, but between the two SD access sites, and you can um, allow SD uh, access segmentation and policy similar to regular SD access transit. Uh, I hope that was not too heavy. Um, there's not much time to talk about SD access. We can talk more, but if you have any questions, I'm ready to take questions now before we move to a real quick demo. Uh, the key take here is difference between DNA and SDA. You don't have to have SDA now. You can get the DNA, use it uh, for traditional management for to just as a controller, as, as a, a, a NMI. And with future, you can create your SDA and start testing it. If you like it, then you can migrate to it. Any questions? So let me connect to DNA Center real quick. I don't have the time to present SD access uh, in full, but maybe I'll have time to show you uh, one fabric and see how we can make it closer to our mind. This DNA center is shared between multiple groups of users, so it won't perform in the way I like it. And by the way, if you want to use it, you can use uh, you can go to dcloud on Cisco and break it and test it. Again, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself. I like to have some discussion about it. We've seen yesterday the DNA Center dashboard. It gave me a quick summary of my network. These are the networks I have. I don't have any critical issues now. I have 68 sites. I have all of these network devices. And let me see how many profiles I have. No SD1 devices. And these are the licensed devices for DNA. Because when you procure uh, new Cisco devices, 
uh, you have the possibility to add DNA license to it. Uh, as we said yesterday, first we go and create a topology or architecture. We have here uh, North America, USA, we created yesterday Virginia as a state or area, then a building Sunset Learning Institute headquarters. We added the address, so it presented um, on the map, and we added floor one, and now we can add devices to this network. Now, let me go to see what type of fabrics I have. Before that, we looked at inventory and plug and play yesterday. These are the inventory of devices I have. I'm looking now to floor one of Sunset Learning Institute. I have no devices assigned, but if I go to California, I'll see a lot. It says now refreshing. Actually, most of the devices in this topology are available in California and mainly in San Jose. And I can look to all devices connected to DNAC when I click here on global. It's refreshing, depends on the size and you'll see the size is not small here. Now, if I wanna talk SDA, I need to go to fabric. Look what we have here. We have two, well, test I created, I'm not gonna say that as a fabric. We have two main fabric, default lamp fabric and San Jose fabric. We have also multiple transit. We have regular IP transit. We have SDA transit and another uh, regular IP transit. Let's take a look at this fabric in San Jose. In this fabric, we have these multiple sites. Let me look at San Jose 01. This is the topology of the device. You will see devices in blue. These are members of the fabric and they have certain rules. Like in this example I have here, I don't know if you can see that, C and B. That means this device is a control plane and border node. This is E, that means it's edge node. If I click on this device, I can see the rules here. It's enabled as border and control node. This one is enabled as edge node. Once you assign this rule to the device, DNA will send the configuration and will give it whatever it needs. Now it's ready to connect. You don't have to do any of these uh, complex configuration. DNA will do it on your behalf. Now, I'll try to see if there is any transit uh, connecting these devices. Yep, so you can see here that these devices are connected to one edge, to the internet, and you cannot remove it because there is a transit um, map server selected. Do I need all of these devices to create any a fabric? No, I can create my own fabric. Let me go here and I can do uh, what we call it fabric in a box. One device will have all rules. Let me go to San Francisco 11 site. I have this device, which is 9300. 9300, uh, as we said, Catalyst 9300 is supported for control, border and edge node. Look, it's not part of the fabric. There is no rule for this device and it's not in blue. I wanna create that fabric and I wanna add this device and give it rules in this network. Let me start by edge node. I'll give it the edge node rule and then let me add it to the network now. It is now uh, bordered by blue. It's not complete blue because I did not save it yet. I wanna add another rule to make this fabric fully functional. I wanna make it a control rule. And now I missed the, the chance to make it a control node because I added as edge node. So let me remove it from fabric first. So I can remove that rule. It's back now as we got it first. Now I can allow it as a control border. Let me do the edge node first. Edge node, if you want to make it uh, embedded wireless, you can do that. And then I want to make it as border. When you configure it as border, there should be a BAGP peering. There should be communication with the non-SD uh, access fabric. So you need here to configure what is your AS number, depend on your design, the honest number here. This is the options which define if this is internal or external border or internal and external border. Here, you select which transit you will use to connect to non-fabric. 
I'm going to use the transit IP address. And to use the transit IP address, you need to define the pool. I hope it won't complain now, but I can add it now. It will complain. So the transit IP doesn't need the pool. So, and you can see here, you can add layer two handoff if you want to do layer two handoff. And here we go, save, apply it now. So I created this small fabric in a box in San Francisco building 11. And I have this device holding all of these rules together. It's a control, border, and edge node. That means all nodes connected to this device, it will act, uh, it, the, the 9300 will act as access switch or edge node for it. If any device wanna communicate with external network, this is a border for it. And any new device will register with this device. It is as simple as that. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, I, I wish we have more time. We can uh, present more use cases here. But uh, I want to just mention that whatever we talked about, if you attended uh, our session yesterday, whatever we can do with Cisco DNA, we can use with Cisco SDA from SWIM, updates, uh, management of wireless, uh, all of the other options we talked about. So we have two more minutes. Um, I hope you have any questions. You can unmute yourself and come to me. If not, then I wish you a very great afternoon and thank you so much for attending.